year of 2001 is a year that I just keep coming back to. I keep inserting the same clip from the New Year's Eve celebration because it's a year that had so many monumental and world-changing events. The first Shrek movie, Hybrid Theory by Linkin Park, GameCube and Xbox, and most important of all, the first Fast and Furious movie. Not to mention September 11th, the day that Jay-Z's classic album The Blueprint came out. 2001 was this unique point in history where Americans still believed that the 2000s were the future and pop culture wanted to evolve past the grungy and derelict past of free thinkers and anger, to give way to more bubbly, whimsical, and hedonistic music. Britney Spears and Justin Timberlake were here to make me feel things in my pants and pop music was back to the way it was supposed to be. Hot people singing catchy, bombastic songs perfect for selling fast food, alcohol, sex, and shoes, all was right with the world. The stupid teens of America were spending their days shopping at the mall, reading fashion magazines, getting HPV, and joining the military. But there was one unlikely dissonant voice speaking out against this rampant, consumerist, mindless, moralist, capitalist wasteland of a country the United States had found themselves in at the turn of the millennia. Osama 2001's Josie and the Pussycats live-action movie was that voice. I fucking swear to god. If you don't know what Josie and the Pussycats is, remember that old boomerang music video where the girls and the cat co costumes did this one? Well anyway, that was based off the 70s cartoon, which was based off the comic book, which was a spin-off of the Archie comic books, and the live-action movie is based off of one of those and has nothing to do with any of them besides the name. I think the cartoon specifically was another one of those Scooby-Doo self-rip-offs Hanna-Barbera made, like Jabberjaw. Me and my friends get no respect. This guy is literally just shaggy. Let's go sis, we gotta get this show on the road! <laughs> I think they had a talking skunk and they solved mysteries, I don't know. I'm sure there's at least one person watching this who's gonna get mad at me for not knowing instead of taking their medication. The very concept of taking this Hanna-Barbera boomerang filler and reinventing it for the modern age is honestly kind of a dumb one. Because who gives a shit? Like, what are you, a fucking moron? Josie and the Pussycats? Live action Josie and the Pussycats movie? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, looks like my retirement is coming a lot sooner than I thought, said a smart movie producer as he lit a cigar and smirked. No idea that this movie would go on to lose almost 25 million dollars. Oops. But the fact is, audiences are more likely to see something if they recognize the name, even if it's as passively as this. When was the last time you saw a movie or even clicked on a YouTube video about something you had absolutely no prior knowledge about? I mean, just look at the view count on this video. Our shepherds know this about us, so they greenlit the concept off name recognition alone and gave total creative freedom to the crazy, effed up renegade filmmaking duo, Harry Alfont and Deborah Kaplan. The pair responsible for a very Brady sequel, Can't Hardly Wait, and of course, Flintstones Viva Rock Vegas. Man, when these two sit down at a typewriter, shit man, it's like getting fire and dynamite together. It'll, it'll, it'll bomb. The film is about a three-piece girl punk band trying to make it in the music industry until one day a smarmy devilish record executive Wyatt Frame discovers them and sends them to the very forefront of pop culture all within a few days. Will the girls and their friendship be able to survive the big time or will ego, jealousy, and corporate rifling spell defeat for the pussycats? These are the questions I will be writing with my own blood on the walls of my apartment. The movie is actually hilarious from the Backstreet Boys parody band Du Jour and their hit song Backdoor Lover which might be about anal sex, but who knows. Or the useless male love interest Alan M, who I personally think is a subversion of how movies usually have a one-dimensional female love interest that barely factors into the plot at all. There's more I could talk about as far as the comedy, I mean, plenty of fourth wall breaks back when that was still cool and not Reddit yet, so it was actually, like, fun and clever. I still don't understand why you're here. I'm here because I was in the comic book. What? <laughs> in a lot of ways, which I'll talk about in a second, the entire movie is a fourth wall break, and despite the marketing making this look like a kid's movie, it has a ton of crude, dirty humor in it. Like, this was very clearly not a kid's movie. Top 10 times that Josie and the Pussycats was not appropriate for kids. Number one, honk if you love pussy. Pussy is code for a girl's ass. Number two, Backdoor lover. Backdoor lover is code for a guy's ass or a girl's ass too, but who's counting? 
Number three. This one's just like so inappropriate that I can't even show it because it's just, it's just like it's too messed up. Number four. You slept with them. Like, I don't even know how to argue that a movie is funny. I mean, I could hit you with a big rock if you disagree with me, but ultimately, that's up to you and your sense of humor. But personally, I was laughing with the movie the entire way through. And if you love early Y2K aesthetic as much as I do, this is a must-see movie for that alone. Plus, the soundtrack is legitimately incredible. Like, I've been listening to it all week. Despite it being a comedy though, if I had to compare it to one other movie to give you an idea of the true themes and the vibe and the actual plot, it has to be John Carpenter's They Live. I fucking swear to god. Every artist just wants to be appreciated in their time, but the simple fact is, it's not up to them. It's not even up to the people who are fans. Like all things, is under the devious control of the shadow government. Yes, the fun, quirky record executive who discovers the band is actually just another cog in a machine designed to lace our entertainment with subliminal messages to brainwash and create a subservient, mindless hive mind of young adults and teens to consume and buy products and then join the military. Which reminds me, today's video is sponsored by the United States Military! It's a borderline schizophrenic conspiracy movie wearing a pink cheetah print. Alex Jones could have written this movie if he had just, uh, drank the chemicals in the water, per se. And none of this is subtext either, like, this is the entire plot of the movie. This isn't like the time I said The Fast and the Furious is about a manipulative, toxic relationship that uses hot girls, beer, and fast cars to convince the audience that Dom's a good guy. Like, that's true, but the conspiracy stuff in Josie and the Pussycats is just as much part of the plot as time travel is part of Back to the Future. Like, that's what the movie is about almost entirely. And as blatant as I think that is, some critics at the time really missed the point in a embarrassing way. You've probably noticed from the clips I've shown that this movie is full of product placement and that's not because the directors were greedy and wanted to squeeze as much money out of this as they could, and again, they really could have used the money. It was done as a deranged meta joke. None of these companies paid for these promos, this did not make anyone any money. I mean, I don't know, maybe someone remembered to pick up some Tide on their way home from the theater? Like, do you really think they built a McDonald's-themed bathroom and a Target-themed jet plane and a Target-themed bedroom not as a joke? That would almost be funnier. Almost any given scene in this movie has more product placement than a grocery store mailer. Look at this New York skyline! Again, if that was done sincerely, that would make it even funnier because as a joke, that's the craziest thing I've ever seen. They put Visa and Gatorade on the Twin Towers. In the world of this movie, there is a 40-story tall McDonald's arch in front of New York and a Sega Dreamcast-themed skyscraper, and you mean to tell me you believe it was done in no jest? My good sir, my countrymen, I'm going to hit you in the head with the aforementioned rock. Actually, never mind. If you couldn't decode the Josie and the Pussycats movie, you obviously have enough brain damage. These critics need to be in assisted living facilities. Josie and the Pussycats urges teenagers to be individuals instead of herd-like consumers. Ironically, in doing so, it contains more product placement than any movie I've ever seen. Are you fucking stupid? At the end of the movie, when the big text that said Josie and the Pussycats is the best movie ever, join the army, flashed on screen immediately following a character saying subliminal, subliminal messages, messages work, work better, better in movies. movies. You didn't even, like, once consider that perhaps the movie was trying to make a statement, you fucking moron. There are multiple, several scenes where this is just outright explained because, again, it is literally the plot of the movie. Huh, I wonder if this movie about subliminal messages is trying to say something about subliminal messages by having every single, literally every single scene drenched in product placement. Nah, probably not. But where this movie goes from based to based as fuck is when they reveal that the music industry orchestrates the deaths of their talent if they step out of line and refuse to continue helping the corporate overlords control the populace. Ever wonder why so many rock stars die in plane crashes? 
overdose on drugs? We've been doing this a long time. If they start to get too curious, our options are endless. Bankruptcy, shocking scandals, religious conversions. We've created a highly rated TV show. Just to explain what happens to these people. I guess this edition of the musical death industry just really struck a chord with me because it's not as crazy as it sounds if you start looking into the dark history of the entertainment industry in America. In the early days of the recording industry, the mafia was heavily involved in the management of artists and distribution of records, particularly through total control of jukeboxes. Most big jukebox companies of the old days being at least somewhat controlled by the mob. They would have absolute authority to manufacture the success of an artist by filling their jukeboxes with artists that they had some sort of stake in through mob-owned record studios and mob-managed artists. Radio stations would base what songs they played on the air off of jukebox plays and bada bing bada boom, violent criminals are deciding the trajectory of pop culture for their own gain. This isn't a conspiracy, this is verified fact. Look into Mayor Lansky, one of the most famous gangsters of all time, who was heavily invested in jukeboxes. Morris Levy, founder of Roulette Records, created the label in conjunction with the Giovesi crime family as a money laundering front, and they barely hit it either. Two of the bands they signed were The Delicates and The Detergents. That's not a joke. MCA was one of the biggest labels and most inescapable of the old days, founded by Lou Wasserman, who was under constant scrutiny for his mob connections until he funded the political career of a B-movie actor named Ronald Reagan, who will go on to become president and block any investigations into MCA and the mob. Then of course there's the infamous mafia lawyer Sidney Korshak, Korshak being named at one point the most powerful man in the world by the FBI due to his connections to everyone from politicians to movie stars, rock stars, prominent businessmen, and nearly any gangster you can think of from Al Capone, Jimmy Hoffa, and basically anyone in the entire Chicago and Los Angeles crime syndicates. And of course, he was close friends with Wasserman and by extension, Ronald Reagan. There's of course the infamous case of the 1966 murder of Bobby Fuller, an up and coming recording artist who shortly after expressing his desire to leave the label and return to a simple life in Texas, was found beaten and drowned in gasoline in his own car in front of his house. And of course, it was ruled a suicide. Long winded point being, when actual brutal criminals are in control of these industries, they won't mind greasing the wheels with a little blood if they have to. Oh, and don't even get me started on non-performance clauses, aka death clauses, that allow labels to fully cash in on the deaths of their clients, and all artists are significantly more profitable after death versus during their lives. A fact that has always been true, but has only become greater once we had every song ever in our pockets. So there is undeniable financial incentive there to make sure your client gets their correct medication, or meets the right person at the right time, or is taking care of their mental health. In the opening scene of Josie and the Pussycats, the boy band du jour becomes wise to the record label's dark deeds, and Wyatt Frame walks into the cockpit of the plane and says, take the, take the Chevy, to the, Chevy to, the to the levee. And then the pilot nods, and they both jump out of the plane as it crashes to the ground, and the news begins airing reports of a no survivor's crash. Du jour's label, Mega Records, has yet to release a statement, but they have released a limited edition commemorative box set complete with a CD-ROM history of du jour in stores tomorrow. The line, take the Chevy to the levee, is of course from Don McLean's song American Pie, which is at least somewhat about the day the music died, aka the time Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and J.P. Richardson's died in a plane crash roughly four minutes after takeoff. In the movie, du jour boards the plane at time code three minutes, and it crashes at time code seven minutes. 7 minus 3 is 4. 4 minutes. The scene was also 4 minutes long. Tell me that wasn't intentional. Tell me this movie wasn't written by absolute geniuses. Whether it's the deep state shadow government or crime syndicates who, let's be honest, are the government, I think it's pretty fitting that this was a movie that failed. It spoke out about the exploitation in the music industry and the ways TV and radio dictated what was cool and what wasn't, and the fact that people follow trends because they just want to be cool and fit in with everyone else who's also doing the same thing. Why should we listen to your band? If you were good, we'd know who you are. 
exploitation of artists and fans alike, the dark history of our entertainment, and the evil that lies just below the surface of some of the most iconic and culturally defining acts. Was this movie sabotaged, bombarded with negative press, and the worst marketing team of all time to make sure beyond any doubt that as few people gave this movie a chance as possible? Thanks to the marketing making this look like a cute little whatever children's film, it was left entirely in the hands of America's young girl age 5 to 14 demographic who would mostly walk away thinking the fashion was cool and the music was fun, which to their credit it was, all as their parents were like, backdoor lover. What the fuck? Now personally, conspiratorial posturing aside, probably not. I think if the powers that be didn't want this movie to come out, they would have just rejected the script and it would have been that normal early 2000s who gives a shit live action cartoon adaptation, like Rocky and Bullwinkle, unless that's also secretly genius, I haven't seen it. Now yes, the marketing team for this movie sucked and tried to sell it as if it were just your run of the mill, PG, glittery pink nothing movie to take your daughter to when it's your weekend, rather than marketing it to the teens and young adults and showing off that it was a deeper and more satirical movie than it really was. And really, it's not even about the band, which is what a lot of the marketing would lead you to believe. Josie and the Pussycats aren't really that interesting of characters. They're just pawns to be manipulated by the labels to manufacture drama for money. They play out the most intentional and sarcastic rags to riches than the band members start fighting with each other in one of them wants to go solo story ever. The joke is that it's so played out, they do it to every band that crosses their sights so they can feed the ego of the the one people like the most and keep them under control then make the behind the music specials about the ones who got kicked out or missed the bag. Fortunately, those girls who saw the movie thanks to the deceptive marketing would grow up and over time this movie would gain a cult following through them and amongst young teens who understood the obvious satire, being continually reevaluated and praised by most people these days. I think this movie really got a raw deal when it debuted back in 2001 and it's probably the biggest tragedy of that year. In a lot of ways, the movie was in real time self-autobiographical. They knew they weren't going to get a fair shot, but they still played their hearts out. It's cool if you like it. It's alright if you don't. Just decide for yourself.